Goodbye, New York, song from the wrong side of the Hudson. You were the big fat city we called hometown. You were the lyrics I sang but never wrote down. You were the lively graves by the highway in Queens, the bodega where I bought black beans, stacks of the times we never read, nights we never went to bed, the radio jazz, the donut cart, the dogs off their leashes in Tompkins Square Park. You were the tiny brass mailbox key, the joy of us and the sorrow of me. You were the balcony bar in Grand Central Station, the blunt commuters and their destination the post-wedding blintzes at 4 a.m., and the pregnant waitress we never saw again. You were the pickles, you were the jar, you were the prize fight we watched in a bar, the sloppy kiss in the basement at Nell's, the occasional truth that the fortune cookie tells, Sinatra still swinging at Radio City. You were ugly and gorgeous, but never pretty. Always the question, never the answer, the difficult poet, the aging dancer, the call I made from a corner phone to a friend in need who wasn't at home. The fireworks we watched from a tenement roof. The brash allegations and the lack of any proof. My skyline, my byline, my buzzer and door. Now you're the dream we lived before. I saw you walking. I saw you walking in Newark Penn Station in your shoes of white ash. At the corner of my nervous glance, your dazed passage first forced me away, tracing the crescent birth you'd give a drunk, a lurcher, nuzzling all comers with ill will and his stench. But not this one, not today. One shirt arms sheared clean from the shoulder, the whole bare limb wet with muscle and shining dimly pink. The other full sheathed in cotton, Brooks Brothers type, the cuff yet buttoned at the wrist, a parody of careful dress, preparedness. So you had not rolled up your sleeves yet this morning when your suit jacket, here the pants dark gray with subtle stripe, as worn by men like you on ordinary days, and briefcase, you've none, reverse commuter come from the pit with nothing to carry but your life, were torn from you as your life was not. Your face itself seemed to be walking, leading your body north, though the age of the face, blank and ashen, passing forth and away from me, was unclear, the sandy crown of hair powdered white like your feet, but underneath not yet gray. 47, 48, the age of someone's father, and I trembled for your luck, for your broad, dusted back, half-shirted, walking away. I should have dropped to my knees to thank God you were alive. Oh, my God, in whom I don't believe. Yeah. This is called September Poem, and it's, the other is, is a kind of poem of witness that happens on the day of 9-11, and this one takes place a year later. So the date really of this poem would be September 11th, 2002. September poem. Now can I say on that blackest day when I learned of the uncountable, the hell-bent obscenity, I felt with shame a seed in me, powerful and inarticulate. I wanted to be pregnant. Women in the street flowing toward home, dazed with grief. In my days, admixed with jealous awe, I wondered if they were, or wished for it too, to be full, to be forming, to be giving our blood's food to the yet to be, to feel the warp of morning's hormonal chucking, the stutter kiss of first movement. At first, the idea of sex, a further horror, to take pleasure in a collision of bodies was vile, self-centered, too lush. But the pushy ennobling pulse of the ordinary won't halt for good taste or knows nothing of tragedy. Thus, today I have a boy, a week old, blessed surplus, a third child. Have you heard mothers, matter of fact, 
call the third, the insurance policy? That wasn't why, and not because when so many people die, we want crudely pining to replace them with more people, but for the wild heaven grazing pleasure and pain of the arrival, the small head crushed and Melanie after a journey out. Sheer cliff of the first day, flat in bed, gut empty, ringed by memories and sharp cries. Sharp bliss in proximity to the roundness, the globe already set a spin, particular of a whole new life, which might in any case end in towering sorrow. This poem, Into the Lincoln Tunnel, is about our daily commute into the city. Into the Lincoln Tunnel. The bus rolled into the Lincoln Tunnel, and I was whispering a prayer that it not be today, not today, please, no shenanigans, no blasts, no terrors, just please the rocking, slightly nauseating gray ride, stop and start, chugga in the dim fellowship of smaller cars, bumper lights flickering, hello and warning. Yes, please smile upon these good people who want to enter the city and work, because work is good, actually, and life is good, despite everything. And I don't mean to sound spoiled, but please don't think I don't know how grateful I should be for what I do have. I wonder whom I'm praying to. Maybe Honest Abe himself, craggy and splendid in his tall chair, better than God to a kid. Lincoln, whose birthday I shared, in whom I took secret pride, born, thus I was, to be truthful and love freedom. Now, with a silent collective sigh, steaming out into the broken winter sun, up the ramp to greet buildings, blue brick and brownstone and steel, candy corn pylons and curving guardrails massively bolted, and men in hard hats leaning on resting machines with paper cups of coffee, a cup of coffee, a modest thing to ask Abe for, dark, bitter, fresh as an ordinary morning. Yeah. On new terms. I'd like to begin again, not touch my own face, not tremble in the dark before an intruder who never arrives, not apologize, not scurry, not pace, not refuse to keep notes of what meant the most, not skirt my father's ghost, not abandon piano or a book before the end, not count, count, count and wait, poised, the control, the agony controlled, for the loss of the one having borne, I can't be, won't breathe without, the foregone conclusion, the pain not yet met, the preemptive mourning, without which nothing left of me but smoke. Okay, this is a love poem. Pink and white. Peonies are the only flower I care for, and when I saw them from the window yesterday, tumbled and heavy along a fence, fully exploded, nodding at the ground, hanging their heads, but not yet spoiled, I remembered a summer maybe seven years ago, or was it 10? I wasn't sure our love would come again. And here I am, almost kissing the grass like that, bursting and rich, cracked all over like broken cake. Makes you cry, but still sweet. This poem is called Add One. Um, for me, it's a poem about how strange and mysterious are the things that children teach us as they grow up. Add one, she's five, wants to know what infinity is. I try, you take the biggest number, you think the last number there is, and you add one more. See, you can always add one. So then the number's bigger still. Infinity means the numbers go on forever. She thinks, index finger raised, swiveling innocently Elvis-style hips in her big girl jeans and shaking her pigtails in a trance of musing. Then cocks her head, terrier set. Is it like God is still alive making numbers? 
Now, who told her, it wasn't me, that God and infinity are spoken in one breath, that what's infinite must be divine? Who, I ask you? The necklace. He lay idling along me, one leg crossed at the other knee, jauntily, tiny man at his dinner, when with brio sucked me in and wah wahed his jaw in quasi parody of his quest, drinking, but playing at drinking, rhyming his eye with mine, and his was full of laughter as his starfish hand upstretched, twirling to conduct the air to turn a song from nothing, waved high and snagged of a sudden, the slender chain, platinum whisper at my neck, dangled from which a diamond his father gave when she was born. He couldn't care, just tugging there, by accident, or in a freshman's stumble toward intent, was for him a joyous purpose, a study of texture, of that solid link that might resist his pull, or not. It took me a long minute to unpeel that clutching paw. And by the way, it felt all wrong against nature. See, if left to my own, I'd let him grasp without a thought what was mine and break it. <laughs>